The Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel. They went up in full force to search for him. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. <coughs> now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will he deliver them into my hands? The Lord answered him, Go, for I surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. So David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. He said, As waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So the place was called Baal Perazim. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. So David inquired of the Lord, and he answered, Do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of the marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly, because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. So David did as the Lord commanded him, and he struck down the Philistines all the way to Gibeon, uh, to Gezer, from Gibeon to Gezer. Chapter 6. David again brought together all of the able men of Israel, 30,000. He and all his men went to Balal in Judah to bring up from there the Ark of, of God, which is called by the name the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim of the ark. They sent the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were guarding the new cart, the cart of God on it, the ark of God on it. Now Ahiah was walking in front of it, and David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord, with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, cisterns, and cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irrelevant Act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark of God. Then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez Uzzah. David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the throne of, to the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now, King David was told, The Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to, the, went to bring up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. When those who were carrying the Ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and fattened calf. Wearing a, a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. While he and all of Israel were bringing up the Ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from the window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in all her heart. They brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside of the tent that David had pitched for it. And David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites, both men and women, and all the people went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, 
how the King of Israel has distinguished himself today, going out half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants as a vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from your house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this, and I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But by the, these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. And Michal, the daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. This is the word of God. Good. Well, welcome and good morning. Let me pray for us and then we'll get underway. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come together once again and that we can turn to your word now. And yeah, Father, we pray that as we do so, that you will speak to us, uh, reveal to us a deeper sense of understanding of who you are and the Lord God that we serve. And Father, I pray that as we turn to your word now, that uh, we'll do so with humility and awe for the God that we serve, as well as joy uh, for the salvation that you have made possible through your Son, Jesus Christ. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Great. So we're working through Samuel once again. Uh, we are now in the third week of this uh, half of uh, Samuel. So this is 2 Samuel 5 and 6 that we are looking at this morning. Um, I don't know who of you are familiar with this passage, this section of 2 Samuel. Uh, I know from my, from my own records reading it a number of years ago, and I think even as a kid, I always found it a bit of a weird, complicated little passage. Uh, some things feel very unfair when you look at it um, and doesn't always make sense. But hopefully this morning we can bring some clarity to it, if there is that confusion. So the first thing that we want to highlight and just pay attention to is that in many ways, when you look at this text, it's going to look like a reversal. Um, so maybe it sounds very similar. Maybe there's certain things that kind of reminding you of certain events that took place in uh, 1 Samuel. And it should do so. So the first thing that we should notice is... That there is the battle, there are battles happening against the Philistines yet again. Um, and this is very similar to the beginning of 1 Samuel. Samuel. 1 Samuel 4, 5, 6, there's this unfolding events that take place. And it takes place with Saul and the Philistines. This time around, we are introduced to a different king, and we are introduced to David, who is now dealing with the Philistines. So there's a different king in place, but the same enemy. The other thing that is introduced is that of the Ark of the Covenant that has been uh, carried and moved around, very similar to what happens with the Philistines the first time around as well. Um, if you recall, just to jog our memory a little bit, Israel went to fight the Philistines. They take the Ark into, into battle, thinking that by them bringing God into the battle with them, uh, they will win. Saul doesn't look and turn to God for help and whether they should do it or shouldn't do it. Um, and they simply <coughs> take the ark in, they are defeated, and the ark is carried off. Not only are they defeated, but the loss that they have is 30,000 foot soldiers are killed on that day. Uh, particularly uh, interesting number that is highlighted in the passage if you go back, as I say, into the unfolding events in 1 Samuel 4 to 6. So they are defeated, 30,000 Israelites are wiped out, and the ark is taken. The ark is then taken, and it shifts, it does a whole bunch of roundabouts uh, as it goes into the Philistine territory, but ultimately it finds its place of rest within the house of a Gentile family, those that are not Israelites. And so when you look at this passage, you have very similar aspects happening. You have 30,000 uh, foot soldiers that are called to service for David. Uh, David goes to war against the Philistines. Um, the ark is eventually moved and it finds a resting place in the house of a Gentile, most likely. And this is just the interesting kind of picture that we see 
how it uh, looks very similar. But at the same time, it's very different. Where it's different, you have firstly David seeking the Lord's counsel before simply going into battle. And because of that, there seems to be favor. The ark uh, is also moved. Oh, that, that was the other aspect. The ark is moved and people die the first time round. And the ark is moved again here and someone dies. Uh, that's the similarity. Difference is the ark finally finds a resting place within Israel. Uh, not just in a Gentile house, but it eventually is taken to Israel and to Jerusalem. So there's some similarities, there's some differences. But as we look a little bit more closely, hopefully you'll see how profound this passage really is. Um, and I'm actually quite excited about it because it's actually quite a beautiful passage. And you may look at me and think I'm nuts for saying that, but uh, we'll take a look and see why. So let's, let's turn there to verse 17 of chapter 5. When the Philistines heard that David had been anointed king over Israel, they went up in full force to search for him. Uh, it's interesting, this concept sounds very much similar to that of when Saul was seeking and searching for David. So David is constantly being sought out by people, and this time it is the, uh, it is the Philistines that are seeking him out. But David heard about it and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. Uh, what's interesting is this name, Rephaim, goes all the way back to the, the race of giants or mighty men or whatever you want to look at it as. Um, so it's quite interesting. David is actually facing the next giant in his story. <laughs> so this is quite an interesting thing that it's in the valley of Rephaim that's happening. And then verse 19, so David inquired of the Lord, shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hands? And this is so crucial because this is something that is setting David apart to Saul. Saul did what he felt he wanted to do or he, had, he just hid it amongst the luggage. But in this case, David is inquiring of the Lord. He is asking the Lord if he should or shouldn't go into battle. But this is where I get jealous of David. And I don't know about you, but he gets such a clear answer, it seems. Not once, but twice in this passage. The Lord answered him, Go, for I will surely deliver the Philistines into your hands. That seems like an easy answer. I, I feel okay with that one still. But it's the next time he inquires of the Lord that it just bugs me. He gets this clear answer, very detailed answer. But so he cries out to the Lord, and the Lord says, He will surely deliver the Philistines into his hands. Verse 20, So David went to Baal Perazim, and there he defeated them. <coughs> He said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called Baal Parazim. So looking at it just in the English, it seems pretty straightforward. It kind of explains why it was called, what it was called, all of that. The weird thing about this is we read it in English. We've got two names and telling us that the Lord broke out and that's why it was named what it was named. But it is actually reading, if you had to read it. The Lord went to, the Lord broke out, and there he defeated them. He, um, he said, as waters break out, the Lord has broken out against my enemies before me. So that place was called, the Lord breaks out. So if you haven't picked up what God did there, is the Lord broke out against them. Um, that is ringing in our ears just from that verse. This is the significance of what God does here. And we're going to pick that up again because that phrase, that language is used again as we go further on. But the Lord breaks out. This is when David has sought favor with the Lord. He has cried out to the Lord and the Lord has said he will deliver the Philistines into his hands. And so the Lord does so by breaking out. The Philistines abandoned their idols there, and David and his men carried them off. Um, just to pick up on this, uh, the first time I read this again, I thought, it seems so weird that David is carrying off the idols of the enemy. Um, but what is interesting is it seems that that was what you do. What you do. 
If you are defeated in battle, you drop everything and you run, which makes sense. So the first thing that you're probably going to drop is this heavy thing that you're lugging along <laughs> that is a symbol of your God. And so similar to what the Israelites did in 1 Samuel, they dropped the ark and left it in the battlefield so that it was carried off. Now the Philistines have done the same. And so by taking it, you are, in a sense, robbing them of their God. But they have actually abandoned their God. You see the interesting picture that you get? When you drop your idol that represents your God in the battlefield, you are abandoning your God. And when the enemy takes it, you are robbing your enemy of what they worship. So there's this weird, interesting picture that it creates. So, more so than it actually being them just being bad and taking it off and they're going to worship those idols. That comes in a different section of Samuel. But particularly here, it is just showing that they are left powerless. They are left powerless. When God <coughs> breaks out against them, they, are, they drop their idols and they are left powerless in the battlefield. And they are wiped out. Verse 22, once more the Philistines came up and spread out in the valley of Raphael. So David inquired of the Lord and he answered. This is the detailed one. Do not, uh, do not go straight up, but circle around behind them and attack them in front of the poplar trees. As soon as you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the poplar trees, move quickly. Because that will mean the Lord has gone out in front of you to strike the Philistine army. That's quite detailed. And so they go out and did as the Lord commanded him. And he struck down the Philistines all the way from Gibeon to Geza. And so once again they are defeated. Once again they have victory over the Philistines. So this is an incredible, crucial turning point in um, part of Israel's history, but also David's kingship. David seeks the Lord. He finds favor with the Lord to be able to lead the armies. He listens to what the Lord has to say, and he conquers the enemy that Saul failed to do so. They conquer the Philistines in these battles. <coughs> Verse 1 of chapter 6, David again brought together all the able young men of Israel, 30,000. So instead of losing 30,000, he is able to bring the 30,000 able-bodied men fit to fight, to bring them together. Uh, verse 2, And he, he and all his men went to Bala in Judah to bring up from there the ark of God, which is called by the name, the name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim on the ark. They set the ark of God on a new cart and brought it from the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. Uzzah and Ahio, sons of Abinadab, were, guide, were guiding the new cart with the ark of God on it. And Ahio was walking in front of it. David and all Israel were celebrating with all their might before the Lord with castanets, harps, lyres, timbrels, sinstrums, and cymbals. And when they came to the threshing floor of Nakon, Uzzah reached out and took hold of the ark of God, because the oxen stumbled. The Lord's anger burned against Uzzah because of his irreverent act. Therefore God struck him down, and he died there beside the ark. This is an interesting shift in events because it seems so victorious. It feels like Israel has finally got victory. They're doing everything right. They, they've gotten the ark. They're taking it back to where, they, where it's supposed to be. They get a brand new cart ready for it. They put it on the cart. Everything seems right. And here they go. Not only that, but when they see that the ark is about to fall, one of them reaches out to try and stop it because they don't want it to get damaged 
to fall off this cart, and he dies. Why has God done this? Why? Well, it's interesting because had I just left it as is, it leaves one unsettled. It feels like God is just acting out, and he's saying, this is not right. You don't touch the ark. But the more we actually go and look in the Old Testament, and going all the way back to Numbers, you don't have to turn there, but I'm just going to read a couple of verses for you out of Numbers 4, and then again out of Numbers, uh, Numbers 7. Listen to this. Numbers 4 reads, verse 4, This is the work of the Kohathites at the tent of meeting, the care of the most holy things. When the camp is to move, Aaron and his sons are to go in and take down the shielding curtain and put it over the Ark of the Covenant Law. Then they are to cover the curtain with a durable leather, spread a cloth of solid blue over that, and put the poles in place. So firstly, the Ark is required to be covered multiple times. Then in Numbers 7, Verses 6, it says, So Moses took the carts and oxen and gave them to the Levites. He gave two carts and four oxen to the Ger uh, Gershonites, as their work required. And he gave four carts and eight oxen to the Meriites, as their work required. They were all under the direction of Ithamar, son of Aaron, the priest. But Moses did not give any to the Kohathites, because they were to carry on their shoulders the holy things for which they were responsible. The issue with this text at first glance is not that God is being too harsh, but that they have not listened to God's requirements. They were to carry the ark on their shoulders to where it needs to be. It was required to be covered and not placed on a, on a cart. So when you look at this, it seems frightening that God would strike a person down. But the detailed instructions that they were given in Numbers highlights for us how, in some sense, disobedient they were in this context. God required them to cover it. To put the poles. If you recall, even how the ark was constructed, there were rings placed on the sides of the ark so that the poles could be put through so that they could carry the ark. And these guys were supposed to be carrying it. And so, not reaching out to stop it from falling, that means that it wasn't being transported in the right way, not according to how God had intended it to be done. There's a couple other factors that we can look at in this passage. And, and you're going to see how that will come into focus a little bit later. But it's also the order in which they were doing things. They were celebrating, moving the ark, and then there was death. I'm going to just leave it at that. And you're going to see how the order changes in a little bit. Let's keep going. We just see David's response then. In verse 8, then David was angry because the Lord's wrath had broken out against Uzzah. And to this day, the place is called Perez, Uzzah. The Lord breaks out or broke out. Again, there's that language. That Perez there is again a reminder that the Lord's, he, it's an outbreak of the Lord's anger or wrath in this context. Verse 9, David was afraid of the Lord that day and said, How can the ark of the Lord ever come to me? He was not willing to take the ark of the Lord to be with him in the city of David. Instead, he took it to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, for three months, and the Lord blessed him and his entire household. Now the king uh, was told 
the Lord has blessed the household of Obed Edom and everything he has because of the ark of God. So David went to bring up the ark of God from the house of Obed Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. But notice the unfolding events. When those who were carrying the ark of the Lord had taken six steps, he sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. Wearing a linen effort, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might, while he and all of Israel were bringing up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. Interesting, there's a slight shifting in dynamic. They took six steps. And then there was a sacrifice made. A bull and a fattened calf were sacrificed. And this was done while David was wearing his priestly robes, his ephod, as they continued then to dance and celebrate. It just seems like there's this shift that has taken place from simply praising and worshipping and getting excited to actually first a sacrifice being made to then leading the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Lord, up to the house of David. As the Ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, uh, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. So just to draw our focus in here, Michal is the daughter of Saul. She was besotted by David. She loved him. And David, in returning from defeating the Philistines, defeating Goliath, came back into the city and she saw him and she was in love with him. It was in the defeat of the Philistines that she fell in love with David. And on that day, they, around that time, they were celebrating, there was dancing, there was partying. And she saw him and she loved him. But this time around, she doesn't. We're going to look at why that's also significant. But what's so interesting is that Saul put her in David's world, focus, as a stumbling block. The hope was that she would be one that would cause David to stumble. And this whole picture, what we actually see, the fact that she is mentioned here is actually so significant. Because after this defeat of the Philistines, after everything that they've done, and eventually getting the ark to the city of David, she has failed, according to what Saul had hoped she would do. She has failed to do. David has done what Saul could never do. And so it's just interesting to see. We heard about her last week. Here she's brought into it again. And with this fight, this battle that takes place with the Philistines, we actually see that the very intention that Saul had for her, she has not been able to deliver on. She's not been able to overcome David and, and distract him and pull him away from what needs to be done. So much so that we will find out and you can read there in verse 23, and that's where it ends, to just show us how this highlights it. And Michal, daughter of Saul, had no children to the day of her death. It was the way in which God had dealt with that family. Saul's line is then cut off through that. And no more will that be an issue in that regard. So I hope that gives us some context, just helps us to see who David is in light of this picture as he defeats the Philistines, as he deals with the ark. What's also significant is as he brings the ark of the Lord uh, into the city, he does so uh, in a sense of humility. And we need to pick up on that. As he comes wearing his ephod, he is coming in a far more humble <coughs> state, if we can put it that way. He's not coming in his kingly robes. He's not coming dressed as royalty, but as a priest. 
someone who is, I don't want to say lower, but serving someone. He is a priest serving the Lord. And a king is supposed to serve the Lord, but for, for us, you look at a king versus you're looking at a person that's dressed as a priest. It might not translate as well today, but for them, seeing a king dressed in their garb, was, that was the highest point that you could get. That a priest was someone that served, served the Lord. And here we have David dressed in an ephod, dancing and singing with all his might. I love that. Wearing a linen ephod, David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. I don't know how exactly that looks. How do you dance with all your might? But he was doing it. And so, this is where the issue comes. He's dancing. There's other servants and people around. And here, Michal sees David. She has an issue. She has an issue with David. Let's pick up in verse 17 and see what transpires. So they brought the ark of the Lord and set it in its place inside the tent that David had pitched for it. David sacrificed burnt offerings and fellowship offerings before the Lord. After he had finished sacrificing the burnt offerings, the fellowship offerings, he blessed the people in the name of the Lord Almighty. Then he gave a loaf of bread, a cake of dates, and a cake of raisins to each person in the whole crowd of Israelites. Both men and women and all the people who went to their homes. When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, going around half naked in full view of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. Sounds like a jealous situation. Perhaps she was to a degree, but I think what she was highlighting is she is the wife of a king. She is the wife of a king who has arrived home and she spots him in the crowd, dressed, let's say he wasn't naked. And it's probably not implying that he was close to being completely naked, but it implies that he was not wearing his royal robes. That's what was missing. He was derobed from his royalty. He was derobed from looking like the king. Listen to her words. How the king of Israel. Notice the fact that she highlights that he is the king of Israel. Has distinguished himself today. I mean, it was quite a procedure. I don't know exactly all the details of what they would wear. But if you go look back in history and look at how the kings were adorned with all those layers of different things. I mean, to just wear a linen effort, you, you are half-dressed <laughs> in comparison. And there he was dancing and singing a picture of not a king. A king would carry himself. He would ride out, wearing his robes, leading people, not standing in the crowd, dancing. This is the shepherd boy exposed once again, dancing in the fields. Well, here he is dancing as he arrives home in victory and bringing, ushering in the, the ark of the Lord. David's response, verse 21. David said to Michal, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people, Israel. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes that by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. 
And so David shows that he is willing to become humble, to look the way he looks, if it means that he gets to glorify and praise God. But not only that, what comes with that is the fact that he is bringing God back into the presence of Israel. That is what he is doing. And for that he will dress as humbly as he can. And dance and celebrate because the Lord has returned. If we can use that language. So this is quite a beautiful passage, as I said in the beginning. And for a number of reasons. This is a celebration, if we can put it that way. A celebration of the return of the true king. David is appointed as king and he brings in the true king. He brings in the Lord into their presence, into the tent, into their dwelling. The Lord has returned. Under Saul's rule, chaos rule. Under Saul's rule, the ark was carried off, 30,000 died. He was scheming and conniving. He was trying to even bring down the be result in the decline of the future king by introducing him to Michal. All of these things interwoven. And here when you look at David, he seeks the Lord. The Lord leads him in battle. 30,000 men standing by his side, not dying. And he brings the Lord into the city. How amazing. But beyond that, we need to look at it from today's context. And really ask ourselves, well, how does this apply for us today? Well, it's so interesting that for the Lord to come, for the Lord to enter, there needs to be a sacrifice. It seems that wherever the ark moves, there is some form of death. It's either because of our disobedience or because of our obedience. When it is disobedience, there is people that are afflicted. And when it is in obedience, it is a sacrifice that is made. So true for our walk today. As Christians, when we come to the Lord God in obedience, and when I say that I mean declaring that we are broken sinners in need of salvation, a sacrifice is provided and the Lord enters. This is what we experience today still. God has not changed in how he operates. Today, we are sitting here because the ultimate sacrifice entered this world. Not only that, but split the curtain. The very thing that veiled and covered the ark. To reveal to us that God is now entering into a relationship with all of humanity. And so as we look at this today, we see a little glimpse of how their world functioned. But our world is so much more different and better in a sense. Because we don't have to worry about how we cover the ark to get it to the next place of worship. No, we sit here in fellowship, in worship with our Lord and Savior. Because He has opened the way. And when we see David... Who does what he does. We can see also a picture of Jesus Christ. Who goes one step further in his humility. Instead of dancing in front of the ark. And instead of simply wearing his ephod to resemble his humility. Our humble king, Jesus, died. He was willing to die so that we could experience 
our Lord and Saviour. So that we could enter in to the Holy of Holies. That we can share in fellowship with Jesus Christ and with our Father. Jesus is far more humble. And I find it so interesting that perhaps there is a, a, just a glimmer of the prophetic word <laughs> in what David says here. I will become even more undignified than this. When you look at Jesus' life, you can see that he, he lived that. How much more did Jesus become undignified? In the sense of what he had to endure, what he went through, how he suffered, how he died, to the point that he was stripped of everything and placed on the cross. That's our king. That's the one who has made it possible. So this passage, I hope that it doesn't leave you feeling like it's unfair. But that actually when you see Jesus Christ and what he has done, it all makes sense. Our Lord has an order to things. He has a way in which he governs and rules and does things. And the only way that we can ever measure up to that is through the true King, Jesus Christ, who makes that way possible. May you be encouraged this morning by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. <clears throat> our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the true King. That through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice, the death and resurrection, that we can enter in that we can come to you that we can call you father and that this morning when we call on your name we are embraced by you so no matter where we are coming from no matter what circumstances in life may we truly know and through your Son, Jesus Christ, we can call you Abba Father. We thank you that this, this passage this morning just helps us to <clears throat> remind us that you have rescued us from a state of your wrath, from a state of being in your breaking out because that has been taken on the cross by Jesus Christ and that we get to rejoice and celebrate in your goodness in your grace in your mercy in your love and we pray this in Jesus name Amen